Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about routing protocol metrics. A router may receive multiple possible paths to get to a destination network because it might have multiple different ways it can get to that network. It might have multiple neighboring routers with paths available through all of them. Only the best path, however, out of all the ones that the router knows about is going to make it into the routing table and be used. So the different interior gateway protocols need some way of determining which is the best path. And they all use different methods to calculate that. Each possible path will be assigned a metric value by the routing protocol, which indicates how preferred the path is. And the lowest metric value is preferred. So high numbers are bad, lower numbers are better. An easy way to remember this is with OSPF, the name of the metric is cost. And just like if you go shopping, the lower the cost of something, the better it is. So remember, the lower the cost or the lower the metric, the more preferred the path is going to be. Our distance vector routers advertise to each other the networks that they know about and their metric to get to each of them. Link state routers advertise all the links in the area of the network to each other. Each router will take that information and then use it to make an independent calculation of its own best path to get to each destination. If the best path to a destination is lost, for example, because a link went down, it will be removed from the routing table and replaced with the next best route, the route that has got the next best metric if one is available. So this is a big advantage of our dynamic routing protocols. They're self-healing. If anything changes on the network, the routing tables will be updated to reflect that. So let's take a look at the different methods, the different metrics that are used by our different routing protocols, starting off with RIP, the routing information protocol. RIP always uses hop count as the metric. A hop is meaning it goes through another router. So how many routers does this router have to go through to get to the destination network? The maximum hop count by default in RIP is 15. You can change that though. But paths which are more than 15 hops away are marked as unreachable by default. So there is a scalability limitation with RIP. In the example you see on the slide here, we've got network 10.0.1.0 slash 24 is connected behind R1. And from R4, all the links in the top path are 100 megabits per second links. They're all fast ethernet. The links going down via R5 are old 10 megabits per second links. But with RIP, because it always uses hop count, it is the bottom path that is going to be preferred because it's only two hops to go from R4 to R5 to R1 rather than three hops going via R3, R2 and R1. So you can see a problem with RIP here. It's always going to use the shortest hop count even if those links are low bandwidth links which would really not be the best path. So because of the scalability limitation and because it also doesn't take the bandwidth of links into account, RIP is not normally used in production networks, only in really small networks or in test environments. So let's go through an example of how the metric is going to work in RIP. So R1 has formed an adjacency with R2 and it will say that, hey R2, you can get to these networks via me. 10.0.1.0 slash 24, which is going to cost you one hop, 10.0.2 and 10.0.3.0 slash 24, which are also one hop away, 
10.1.3.0/24 is two hops away, and 10.1.2.0/24 is three hops away. Because the first three networks there are all directly connected on R1. 10.1.3 is behind R5 from R1's point of view, and 10.1.2 is behind R4. So they are an additional one or two hops away. So R2 will get that information. It will update its routing table. It will then pass the information on to R3. So R2 will say, hey, R3, you can get to these networks via me. 10.0.0.0 slash 24 is one hop because R2 is directly connected to it. 10.0.1, 10.0.2, and 10.0.3.0 slash 24 are two hops away. R3 will then pass the information on to R4 and it will tell R4 you can get to 10.0.0.0 slash 24 through me, it will cost you two hops. 10.0.1 and 10.0.2.0 slash 24 are three hops away and 10.1.0.0 slash 24 is one hop away. So that's the information getting propagated. So if we look at the information that reached R4 from R3, R3 told it that you can get to the 10.0.1.0 slash 24 network through me and it's going to be three hops. Okay, so that was along the top path. R1 is also directly connected to R5 and we're running RIP everywhere, so it will form an adjacency with R5 as well and it will also send updates to R5. So it will tell R5 that you can get to 10.0.0, 10.0.1 and 10.0.2.0 slash 24, it's one hop because they're directly connected on R1 and 10.1.0.0 slash 24 is two hops. So it sends that information to R5, R5 will update its routing table and then it will pass the information on to R4. It will tell R4 you can get to 10.0.0, 10.0.1 and 10.0.2.0 slash 24 through me. It will be two hops and also to 10.0.3.0 slash 24 and that will be one hop. So if I just skip back a few slides here, you see along the top path R3 told R4 you can get to the 10.0.1.0 slash 24 network and it's three hops away. R5 also advertises the 10.0.1.0 slash 24 network, but it's only two hops away. So R4 learns two potential paths it can use to get to that 10.0.1 network, either through R3 or R5. R3 is three hops away. R5 is only two hops away, so it is the route via R5 that is going to make it into the routing table because it's got the best metric. Both routes will be there in the RIP database, but it's only the best one that actually makes it into the routing table, which is the one that's got the lowest metric. So R4, like I just explained, says I learned those two possible routes to get to the 10.0.1.0 slash 24 network. Three hops via 10.1.1.2, out interface fast ethernet 0 slash 0. Two hops via 10.1.3.2, out fast ethernet 2 slash 0. And it puts the best one in the routing table, which is via R5. So if we do the show IP route, we see just that one best route via R5 has made it into the routing table. Okay, so that was how RIP works with the hop count as its metric. Let's look at the metrics for the other routing protocols as well. I don't need to go through it step by step for these other ones though. So you saw a problem there with RIP. If I go back a couple of slides, the top path in our network topology is all 100 meg links but the bottom path is only 10 megabits per second links. So really we would prefer the traffic to go across the top path. But because RIP uses hop count, the traffic is always going to go along that worse bottom path. So let's see how it works with OSPF as compared with that. So OSPF does take bandwidth into account. It uses cost as the metric, which is automatically derived from interface bandwidth by default. You can also manually configure the cost of links if you want to manipulate the path, but OSPF is typically going to take the best path anyway. And in our example, it 
it is going to prefer the path from R4 to R3 to R2 to R1 for the 10.0.1.0 slash 24 network. So unlike RIP, which used hop count and went along the bottom path, which we didn't want, OSPF is going to use cost, which takes bandwidth into account, and it's going to go along the top path because those links have got much higher bandwidth. So if we have exact same topology and we enable OSPF on our interfaces and do a show route, you'll see that traffic will go across the top path. Traffic is going out interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 from R4, which is the top path. ISIS also uses cost as the metric, but unlike with OSPF, it's not automatically derived from the interface bandwidth. All links have got an equal cost by default. So if you want to force a particular path to be used in ISIS based on which path has got the best bandwidth, you're going to have to manually configure that. It's not going to do it automatically like OSPF does. If you don't manually set the link costs in ISIS in our example, then the lowest hop count will be used, which was the bottom path in our example again. So again, it's going to use path R4 to R5 to R1 by default in ISIS. Now in ISIS, you can manipulate it to go along the top path. In RIP, you're not really able to do that. The last IGP we have is EIGRP, and it uses the bandwidth and delay of links to calculate the metric. Load and reliability can also be configured, but they're ignored by default. So bandwidth is used the same as it was with OSPF. We also have delay as well. But the way that EIGRP works, it's not like it's sending probes over the links to measure what the delay is. It uses a fixed delay, which is based on what the bandwidth is. So basically, it's based on the bandwidth again. You can manually configure the delay on links if you want to manipulate the path. So with OSPF and EIGRP, because it is going to use the best bandwidth links anyway, typically it's going to choose the path that you would want it to. But if for some reason it's not, you can override that with manual configuration. And in that example, again, it's going to use the top path because those are the higher bandwidth links. It will use that path by default. So last slide, let's consider how we would choose a routing protocol. Like I said before, you do not want to be running multiple routing protocols inside your organization because it's going to get messy. It makes things hard to work with each other. Organizations will almost always standardize on one protocol. Really, the only reason they would have multiple different protocols is if there was a merger or there was some kind of historical or political reasons for it. OK, so we're going to choose one routing protocol. Comparing them, RIP uses hop count and has a default maximum metric of 15. So it's not usually used in production networks because of its scalability limitations. EIGRP is very simple to maintain, calculates changes very quickly, and its metric calculation will normally choose the best path by default. It is, however, typically only supported on Cisco routers. It was originally completely Cisco proprietary. Cisco made moves to open it up a while ago, but it's still mostly only supported on Cisco routers. So it kind of forces you into using all Cisco routers if you're going to use EIGRP. OSPF's metric calculation will typically choose the best path by default, like EIGRP. It is an open standard, which is supported by all vendors' routers, and because of this, it's the most commonly deployed IGP today. It is, however, more complicated to maintain than EIGRP. And finally, ISIS links need to be manually configured, or it will use hop count to determine the best path, which is not usually what we want to happen. It's typically only used in service provider networks or large organizations with their own MPLS network who choose it because of its scalability. Okay, so because of this, it really comes down to either EIGRP 
or OSPF for most organizations. EIGRP is the simplest one to use and it works great, but you can really only use it if you're using only Cisco routers. OSPF also works great as well, but it's more complicated to maintain. It is, however, supported on all vendors' routers. Okay, so that's everything I needed to tell you about metrics. Let's have a look at how it works in the lab next. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.